Subcommittee on Investigation, our first hearing of this session. I want to recognize the extraordinary and distinguished history of this panel in rooting out waste and fraud and abuse in government and uh, thank my ranking member, partner in this effort, Senator Johnson. It has been a bipartisan effort in the history of this panel and we are seeking to continue that tradition. Uh, when I was appointed earlier this year, I pledged to continue the work of this committee in insisting on accountability. Our work is already underway and we are meeting today to protect seniors who are enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans who face unacceptable barriers in accessing necessary care and treatment. Medicare is the safety net that ensures that all American seniors receive the health care they need. Medicare Advantage, run by insurance companies, is becoming an increasingly integral part of that program. As of 2023, more than 30 million Americans were enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans, representing more than half of Medicare eligible Americans. This number is only continuing to grow. And I want to be clear, I support Medicare Advantage programs, the flexibility that they provide for seniors across the country. Many seniors are very happy with Medicare Advantage and want to continue with them. But the reason we're here today is that all too often the big insurance companies that run Medicare Advantage plans have been failing seniors when they need treatment and care. Medicare Advantage insurers are required to provide beneficiaries with the same minimum level of coverage as traditional Medicare. And yet we've seen ev evidence indicating that in many instances, they are failing to do so. In fact, failing entirely because they are denying or delaying care. And tragically, we've heard from many families who face denials in the middle of major medical crises, forcing them and their loved ones to fight, even as they are fighting for their lives. And the fight for insurance coverage is detracting from the fight for their health. And perhaps most troubling of all, there is growing evidence that insurance companies are relying on algorithms rather than doctors or other clinicians to make decisions to deny patient care. In a report released last year, the Inspector General of the Department of Health and Human Services identified a large number of instances where Medicare Advantage companies refused to authorize treatment for care. They clearly met Medicare coverage requirements. In one case, a cancer patient had a common scan needed to determine if the disease had spread, delayed by their insurer for more than a month. In another, an insurer refused a walker to a 76-year-old patient. The insurance company argued that this patient had been provided a cane within the past five years and therefore didn't need a walker. In each of these cases, the insurer's decision overlooked the treating physician's assessment of what their patient needed. Our subcommittee's been hearing from patients and providers alike who have stories of care being delayed or denied. And many of these stories involve patients who have been hospitalized for serious medical issues and who need nursing home or rehabilitative care before they're ready to return home. These denials have become so routine that some patients can predict the day on which they will come. Advocates who have helped patients appeal denials of medically necessary care have uncovered documents showing that these decisions are not being made by doctors or other trained professionals at all. Instead, 
Companies are using algorithms that have been programmed to predict how much care a patient needs without ever meeting a patient or their doctor. Insurers may refer to these algorithms as tools used for guidance, but the denials they generate are too systematic to ignore. All too often, black box AI and algorithms have become a blanket mechanism for denial. And the insurance companies insist that those AI mechanisms are proprietary, but part of what needs to happen is to make them more transparent so that patients and providers know, along with the public, how they are being used. Major insurance companies who run Advantage Medicare Advantage plans are making record profits. Gross margins for Medicare Advantage enrollees are well over double those for individual market, group market, or Medicare Advantage, Medicaid managed care enrollees. The largest Medicare Advantage provider even said in its most recent report that a major reason for their increase in revenue between 2021 and 2022 was in fact the growth of Medicare Advantage. This chart speaks volumes about the burgeoning profits of Medicare Advantage plans, in part because of the denial or delay of care. Insurers are, in effect, denying Americans necessary care in order to fatten and pad their bottom lines. And that phenomenon is unacceptable. The information that this subcommittee has uncovered so far and that we will hear today demonstrates the need for additional investigation into the practices of these powerful insurance companies. And I want to put these companies on notice. If you deny life-saving coverage to seniors, we are watching, we will expose you, we will demand better, we will pass legislation if necessary, but action will be forthcoming. Today, we sent bipartisan letters to the nation's largest Medicare Advantage insurers, United Health, Humana, and CVS Aetna. They collectively cover more than 50% of Medicare Advantage beneficiaries. We are asking for internal documents that will show how decisions are made to grant or deny access to care, including how they are using AI. Our nation's seniors should not have to fight to receive medically necessary care. I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses. I wanna thank each of you for being here because each of you has an important aspect of this story to illuminate. And again, I wanna thank the ranking member for his involvement and contribution and turn to him now for his comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome, to, welcome you to the Permanent Subcommittee Investigations. Uh, uh, this is a long bipartisan tradition of uncovering waste, fraud, abuse, and outright corruption. Uh, the subcommittee's previous work brought much needed transparency to the public, and I look forward to continuing that tradition with you as the new, uh, the new chairman. Um, I guess what I'd like to do is uh, enter my prepared remarks in the record and just you know, speak uh, extemporaneously here. The, the hearing today is gonna be focusing on uh, what I would consider an issue caused by uh, a third party payer system. Uh, when I was in the private sector, uh, I would be renewing my insurance coverage year after year. And it was amazing how every year I'd have to be talking to the insurance agent, okay, now what's being excluded this year? It, it just never made any sense. Uh, but that's what insurance carriers were trying to do is they would, they would try and exclude things based on the actuarial, actuarial tables to try and limit the cost of the insurance. And we see the exact same phenomenon when insurance carriers, in this case, uh, Medicare Advantage carriers, uh, are trying to limit the abuse potentially of some services. And so they get into this pre-certification process. 
But I guess what I, what I would argue is the, the, the way we'll probably address this is, again, through some kind of government bureaucratic action, which I would say probably is not going to work. Uh, part of the problem here, again, is, is a trend over time where we've pretty well removed the benefit of free market competition from healthcare. I was trying to point out there, there are two areas of our economy that we are habitually dissatisfied with, healthcare and education. They're largely monopolies. We've driven the benefit of free market competition out of them. Uh, and just to reiterate what free market competition does, it generally guarantees, not, it's not perfect, but it generally guarantees the best possible price, the best level of customer service, but the best quality of service. I mean, that's what a free market does. We're not getting that in Medicare Advantage necessarily. We're not getting that oftentimes in, in education. I do have the chart right here. Shows you the trend over time. If you go further back in time, uh, this is even more stark, but uh, these are numbers are pretty solid. So back in 1949, 68 cents of every dollar in healthcare was paid for by the patient. And 32, 32 cents was paid by some 30 par third party payer, primarily back then some kind of insurance system. Now, only 11 cents of every healthcare dollar is paid for by a consumer, uh, and 89 cents is paid for largely by government or by third-party payer insurance companies. And, and when you have consumers not worried about the cost of things, you know, prices go out of control. If, if we had the same system, for example, operating in food, we'd, we'd all be eating filet mignon every night. Or in autos, we'd all be driving Maseratis. So we need to look at the root cause and the root cause of this problem, truthfully, is we've driven consumerism out, which has then driven insurance carriers to have these pre-authorization programs, pre-certification, and they're always far from perfect. So, yeah, I'm going to try and continue in this subcommittee to, to focus on the root cause and actually fix these problems, rather than always be looking at very expensive Band-Aids. And we've got a lot of problems. I, I think the COVID, the pandemic uh, exposed an awful lot of problems within our medical establishment, within our federal health agencies who've been captured by big pharma. Talking to the chairman, I think there's an awful lot of agreement we have. I'm highly concerned about the negative impact of pharma companies spending billions of dollars capturing our meat as, as they've captured our, our health agencies as well. So I truly hope that moving forward here, uh, fully support what we're doing here in this hearing and taking a look at the abuses of the pre-certification process and denials of uh, necessary treatment in Medicare Advantage, but there's so much more we have to look at. And, and I really hope that we can work together in a nonpartisan fashion because these are problems we need to fix for the American public. So again, thank you. Thank look you. forward to the testimony. Thank you very much. Let me introduce the witnesses and then uh, as we customarily do, I'm gonna swear you in before your testimony. Uh, Welcome to Megan Tinker, Chief of Staff of the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General. In that role, Ms. Tinker serves as the Deputy Inspector General for the OIG's immediate office and oversees OIG's Office of Congressional Affairs, Office of Communications, and Office of Operations. Dr. Jeannie fugelstein Benick is Associate Director of the Program on Medicare Policy at KFF, formerly Kaiser Family Foundation. Dr. fugelstein Benick previously worked as an economist on the staff of the Senate Budget Committee and has held positions with an economic consulting firm and numerous nonprofit policy organizations. Christine Jensen Huberty is the Lead Benefit Specialist Supervising attorney for the Greater Wisconsin Agency on Aging Resources. Ms. P Ms. Huberty provides free legal assistance to seniors in northern Wisconsin on issues including Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, SNAP, benefits, housing law, and consumer law. And she's represented numerous seniors who have faced denials of care in their Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, Lisa Graybert is a visiting research professor at Marquette University College of Nursing. Her research focuses on Medicare with an emphasis on post-hospitalization. She's previously handled healthcare policy while on the staff of the House Ways and Means Committee. Gloria Bent 
is the widow of Gary Bent, a Medicare Advantage plan enrollee. Ms. Bent is a former registered nurse, a retired director of religious education, and the mother of four children. Ms. Bent was married to Gary Bent for 56 years until his death on March 3 of this year. During his life, Gary Bent served as an ordinance op corps officer in the United States Army, high school physics teacher, and he spent 23 years as a professor in the physics department of the University of Connecticut. Ms. Bent spent much of her time during Mr. Bent's last year of life advocating for him to receive needed benefits under his Medicare Advantage plan, and we look forward to hearing more about her, about, from her, about that experience today. If you would please rise, I will swear you in. Do you swear that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Tinker, why don't you begin? Good afternoon, Chairman Blumenthal, Ranking Member Johnson, and other distinguished members of the subcommittee. I am Megan Tinker, Chief of Staff for the HHS Office of Inspector General. I appreciate the invitation to discuss OIG's important Medicare Advantage work. Today, I will highlight a critical issue assessed by OIG reports, potential barriers seniors may face when accessing care under Medicare Advantage. Based on data released this month, 30 million individuals, or 50% of all Medicare enrollees, are now in Medicare Advantage. That is a significant number of Americans who rely on plans to authorize and pay for the care they need. This expansion has been rapid. Just a decade ago, only 29% of Medicare enrollees were in Medicare Advantage. Fast growth has increased vulnerabilities and the need for robust program integrity measures. OIG work has demonstrated that the risks of fraud, waste, and abuse in managed care are significant. Last month, Inspector General Christy Grimm spoke to a group of managed care plan executives. She emphasized that Medicare Advantage plans need to step up their efforts and focus on preventing the types of issues OIG work continues to find. One area of concern highlighted by OIG work and raised by this subcommittee are plan practices that impede access to care. I would like to highlight some of OIG's work on this topic. In an evaluation published in April of 2022, OIG found that Medicare Advantage plans sometimes delayed or denied enrollees access to medical care, even though the care was needed and met Medicare coverage rules. In other words, these services likely would have been approved by original Medicare. For many of these denials in our review, Medicare Advantage plans used internal clinical criteria that are not required by Medicare. For example, a plan denied a request for a CT scan that was medically necessary to rule out a life-threatening aneurysm. The denial was because the beneficiary did not first have an x-ray but Medicare has no such requirement. In another case, a plan denied a request for a walker for a 76-year-old patient with post-polio syndrome. Having a right knee that buckled, the patient was at risk for falls, and denying the claim went against CMS's policy to cover equipment that is medically necessary. Medicare Advantage plans internal criteria are supposed to be no more restrictive than original Medicare. However, the capitated payment system in Medicare Advantage creates a potential incentive for insurers to deny access to services for enrollees. Plans are paid a fixed amount of money each month for each enrollee, regardless of the number or cost of services that are provided. To address these issues, OIG recommended that CMS issue new guidance on the appropriate use of clinical criteria and that CMS assess the use of these criteria in its audits of Medicare Advantage plans. OIG work has already had impact. Last month, CMS issued a final rule that puts in place new requirements to protect enrollees from an inappropriate use of prior authorization. The rule streamlines prior authorization requirements 
and strengthens protections against denials for medically necessary services. OIG appreciates and shares your interest in ensuring that Medicare Advantage enrollees get the medical care they need. However, with our limited resources, comprehensive oversight of HHS programs is challenging. We only have two cents to oversee every $100 HHS spends. We conduct efficient, consequential, high impact oversight work with our limited resources. But much more needs to be done to thwart fraud, identify misspent funds, and protect people from harm. To be candid, without more resources, we will be unable to keep pace with the threats to the department's programs. That is especially true for Medicare Advantage. OIG is turning down between 300 and 400 viable criminal and civil healthcare fraud cases each year. These uninvestigated cases represent unchecked fraud and the potential for patients to be put in harm's way, including individuals enrolled in Medicare Advantage. Notwithstanding rigorous efforts by OIG, HHS, and Congress, serious fraud, waste, and abuse continue to grow and threaten HHS programs. If enacted, the President's FY 2024 requested resources for OIG would go a long way towards addressing shortfalls, particularly with respect to combating fraud and increasing our oversight of Medicare Advantage plans. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thanks, Ms. Tinker. Uh, Ms. Fugelson Bennett. Good afternoon, Chairman Blumenthal, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today about Medicare Advantage, including the prior authorization, payment, and appeals process. I am Jeannie Fugelson Bennett, an Associate Director in KFF's program on Medicare policy. KFF provides nonpartisan health policy analysis, polling, and journalism. We are not affiliated with Kaiser Permanente. My testimony will describe the Medicare Advantage market today, the use of prior authorization by Medicare Advantage insurers, and gaps in data that make our understanding of the impact of prior authorization on uh, Medicare Advantage enrollees difficult. In recent years, as has already been mentioned a couple times today, Medicare Advantage enrollment has grown rapidly. And as of January this year, over half of all eligible Medicare beneficiaries are enrolled in a private Medicare Advantage plan. As enrollment has grown, so has the number of plans available. This year, the average Medicare beneficiary has 43 Medicare Advantage plans to choose from, offered by nine different insurers. The increase in, in enrollment and the number of plans is due to several factors, but largely the attraction of extra benefits, usually offered for no supplemental premium, and the potential for lower cost sharing drives Medicare beneficiaries to these plans. Medicare Advantage insurers are able to offer plans with extra benefits and potential for lower out-of-pocket spending because they are supported by a generous payment system. According to MedPAC, Medicare Advantage insurers receive $2,300 per person above their costs of covering Medicare covered services. They use this money to pay for extra benefits like vision, dental, and hearing, lower cost sharing, and reduce premiums, as well as add to their profits. Medicare Advantage plans are able to have lower costs than traditional Medicare for Medicare covered services, in part because they use tools that are rarely, if ever, employed in traditional Medicare to manage utilization. One example is prior authorization. Virtually all Medicare Advantage enrollees are in a plan that requires prior authorization for at least some services, usually high cost services like chemotherapy or skilled nursing facility stays, services that people use at some of the most medically fragile points in their lives. We use data reported to CMS to examine the use of prior authorization and Medicare Advantage. We found that in 2021, over 35 million prior authorization requests were submitted to Medicare Advantage insurers, of which 2 million were denied, or 6%. Though a small share, just 11%, were appealed, when Medicare Advantage insurers reconsidered their initial decision, they overturned that decision more than 80% of the time. The low rate of denied prior authorization requests may mean that the prior authorization process is not well targeted. Additionally, 
the high success of appeals suggests that maybe some of, more of those uh, initial decisions should have been favorable to the enrollee in the first place. The process is thus potentially leading to inefficiencies in the use of provider staff resources and time, unnecessary delays in patient care, and increased burden on Medicare Advantage enrollees during a point in their, their lives when they are potentially in very poor health. The publicly available data on prior authorization and Medicare Advantage has substantial gaps that limit transparency into how the program is performing. For example, there is no information about what services are denied, whether certain beneficiaries are denied prior authorization requests more often, or how long it takes the Medicare Advantage insurers to respond to a prior authorization request. As a result, policymakers don't have the information they need to conduct oversight, and importantly, Medicare beneficiaries are left without important information when making a decision between traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage or between Medicare Advantage plans. CMS finalized a rule recently to clarify coverage of Medicare uh, prior authorization and Medicare Advantage, the coverage criteria, or the duration and the duration for which those uh, authorizations have to be valid. However, it will be difficult to assess both the current impact of prior authorization policies as well as changes on enrollees without better data. As enrollment in Medicare Advantage continues to grow, better information about prior authorization, as well as other tools to utilize, to manage utilization and contain costs will be necessary. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Ms. Huberty. Thank you, Chairman Blumenthal, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee. <clears throat> My name is Christine Huberty, and I've served as, as an attorney at the Greater Wisconsin Agency on Aging Resources since 2015. As an advocate for senior residents of Wisconsin, part of my job is to provide legal assistance to residents experiencing Medicare coverage denials. I'm here today to share my experiences with Medicare Advantage plans routinely denying coverage of skilled nursing facility stays, which endangers the health and safety of beneficiaries, causes unnecessary stress and financial hardship, and many times shifts expenses to the state's Medicaid program. Skilled nursing facilities are intended to be a temporary rehabilitation or nursing care um, facility after a hospital stay. For example, if a person breaks a hip, needs surgery, their doctor generally recommends several weeks in a skilled nursing facility until they're ready to safely go home. If a senior has original or traditional Medicare, they can expect to receive up to 100 days of coverage for their stay with no hassle. If a senior has a Medicare Advantage plan, however, they can expect to receive a denial well before their doctors even say they're ready to go home. This is despite the requirement that's been discussed that Advantage plans must offer the same benefits and apply the same coverage criteria as original Medicare. When a patient first receives a denial, they're thrown into a maze of red tape that is dizzying even to our experienced legal team. The initial denial is made not by the Advantage plan, but a third-party contractor using an algorithm. A computer determines what a patient's predicted length of stay should be based on millions of past de beneficiary data points, not the patient's plan of care or the advice of their doctors. Then, at each additional level of appeal, if the patient actually chooses to fight it, the denials are upheld by quality improvement organizations with little to no explanation. If a patient is successful with an appeal while still in the facility, they can expect a new round of denials to start in a matter of days. Patients caught in this maze are forced to make a devastating decision, stay in the rehab facility and pay thousands of dollars out of pocket or go home against medical advice. In Wisconsin, we have a unique legal services program with attorneys able to take these cases at no cost. When we represent clients at federal hearings, more often than not, the denials are overturned. But this is after months of document gathering, preparation of summary briefs, rounding up witnesses, and a telephone hearing against a team of representatives brought by the Advantage plans if they show up at all. Even if a patient is successful at hearing, it can still take well over a year to get reimbursed. This issue has even hit me personally. This past holiday season, a family member called me and explained that his 89-year-old mother had fallen while and was hospitalized and entered a skilled nursing facility for rehab. 
They'd received a denial after just a week, and they didn't know what to do because her doctor said she still wasn't ready to go home. My first question was, does she have an advantage plan? When the answer was yes, my heart sank because I knew immediately what this family was gonna be up against. After a total of three falls, two hospital stays, and repeated denials, she ultimately went home against medical advice and decided that the appeals process was too stressful to pursue. Fortunately, this family had enough money to pay for the denied charges and lived close enough to help locate safe housing options and home care. But what does this situation look like for an individual with no family or friends or legal representation? In Wisconsin, the average cost of just one day in a skilled nursing facility is over $300. The individuals who can't afford to stay will likely be advised to spend down their assets, forcing poverty to qualify for the state's Medicaid program. Now, these are not uninsured individuals. These are individuals who have chosen and paid for a Medicare product that was heavily marketed and aggressively sold to them. They're not getting the coverage that they paid for, and they're met with hurdles at every turn. Nor are these patients abusing the system. No one truly wants to be in a skilled nursing facility. Patients are actively trying to get home. In the case examples that I've provided your investigative team, you'll note that in nearly all situations, the patients returned home on the timeline prescribed by their doctors, and sometimes even earlier, not the unrealistic and at times unconscionable timeline forced upon them by their Medicare Advantage plan. Our most valuable citizens are up against an impossible system, and I wanna thank you for your time to investigate these practices. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, Lisa uh, Graber, please. Chairman Blumenthal, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee, I am Lisa Graber, a visiting research professor in the College of Nursing at Marquette University. I am a former congressional staffer for the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Ways and Means, and I'm honored to testify before the subcommittee today. Medicare Advantage is an important part of the Medicare program. Just two weeks ago, MA enrollment surpassed fee-for-service for the first time in the history of the program. Medicare beneficiaries are voting with their feet and are increasingly revealing their preference for MA, which now represents 50.2% of the market. Beneficiaries select MA for a variety of reasons, including improved financial protections, additional benefits, prior experience with managed care, and choice simplicity. As part of the trade-off of receiving a comprehensive benefits package, MA beneficiaries accept a provider network and some utilization review requirements, such as prior authorization. It is important to remember the context of the deployment of utilization review. Our country spends a significant portion of its economic power, nearly one-fifth of our GDP on healthcare. The MA program was designed to shift financial risk from the government to private plans. In exchange for taking that financial risk, MA plans are also afforded tools such as prior authorization to assist in managing that risk. If those tools are altered, risk will shift back to the taxpayer in the form of higher costs. This is the economic dynamic in the Medicare program, and it is our expectation that a Medicare beneficiary has a basic understanding of this when they elect their choice of coverage. However, it may not be clear to beneficiaries what they are agreeing to when it comes to prior authorization. Further, when it comes, further, it may not be clear to a variety of stakeholders what prior authorization exactly is. There is no statutory definition, and until a month ago, there was no regulatory definition of prior authorization. On April 12th, CMS finalized new regulatory changes for prior auth, which will become effective for the first time on June the 5th of this year. Now that the rules of engagement on prior authorization have been clearly articulated, it is worthy to note, without a healthy push from Congress, CMS may not have been motivated to make these changes. In the 117th Congress, two companion bills, the Improving Seniors' Timely Access to Care, were introduced. The Senate version was introduced by a member of this subcommittee, Senator Marshall. These bills focus on many of the same changes CMS recently finalized, as well as changes included in a separate proposal by CMS for an electronic system. Prior to advancing the bill in the House, the Congressional Budget Office, or CBO, released a budgetary score for the bill of $16.2 billion over the 10-year budget window. CBO score represents a warning that tinkering with utilization review tools such as prior authorization can have significant financial downsides to the solvency of the Medicare program. 
H.R. 3713 alters the economic agreement between MA plans and the federal government. To better understand the unintended consequences of this policy change, we need to examine some failures in the fee-for-service side of Medicare. The testimony provided by Megan today provides the necessary background on a service frequently targeted by prior authorization, inpatient rehab facilitation facilities, or ERFs. On an annual basis, CMS spends $60 billion on fee-for-service post-acute care. In the last decade, three of the four post-acute payment systems have been comprehensively reformed, including home health, nursing homes, and long-term care. ERFs have yet to be reformed. To receive the highest level of payments, ERFs must maintain a 60% of their annual census treating patients across 13 complex medical conditions, including stroke, traumatic brain injuries, and spinal cord injuries. Yet policymakers have questioned the so-called 60% rule and have recommended it be increased to 75%. Policymakers have also questioned the profitability of ERFs. The fee-for-service ERF Medicare margin is 13.5%. Compare this margin to long-term care hospitals, ERF's closest competitor, with a margin of just 2.9%. The difference between these two hospital types is that Congress has done the hard work to reform LTACs, but not ERF's. Where fee-for-service has failed, Medicare Advantage has filled the gap with prior authorization. We don't know the median MA compliance rate for these 13 conditions, and I strongly recommend the subcommittee compels CMS to publicly release this information. If the median MA compliance rate is higher than the fee-for-service rate, Congress should consider altering the 60% rule. Such a policy change would ensure parity between fee-for-service and MA and would obviate the need for additional prior authorization of ERF discharges. Thank you for the opportunity to share my perspective with the subcommittee. I look forward to continuing to work with you on these important issues. Thank you very much, Ms. Graber. Ms. Bent. You have to turn on your microphone. The light is lit. Does that mean it's on? I can You're hear. On. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Blumenthal, Ranking Member Johnson, members of the subcommittee, for the opportunity to come here today and speak on behalf of my late husband. You ask in your invitation if seniors enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans face barriers accessing necessary care and treatment. My answer, based on our experience of getting and maintaining rehabilitation and skilled nursing care for my husband, is yes. Yes, they do. The barrier we encountered was a third-party company hired by our Medicare Advantage plan to authorize or deny care and treatments. My husband had been treated with immunotherapy for two years for melanoma. A year passed without treatment and no sign of melanoma's return. We thought we were in a major remission and we celebrated. Then last Memorial Day, when he couldn't remember how to tie his shoes, my husband asked to be taken to the emergency room. In the emergency room, we learned that there was a lesion in his brain and it was bleeding. The lesion and a hematoma were removed surgically on June 1st and pathology confirmed what we all feared. It was melanoma. Gary came out of surgery with significant cognitive and mobility deficits. He had upper body weakness. He couldn't walk. He had left neglect. That means that his brain no longer registered that he had a left side to his body. He was heartbreakingly confused and disoriented. His neurosurgeon wanted him transferred to an acute rehabilitation and skilled nursing hospital for intense physical, occupational, and speech therapy. Acute rehabilitation services were denied. The third party authorization party determined that my husband couldn't withstand intense therapy. 
even though his neurosurgeon felt it was appropriate. A transfer to short-term rehab and skilled nursing was approved, and he was transferred there on the 14th of June. But before the staff of the facility could even evaluate my husband or develop a plan of care, I was contacted by someone who identified themselves as my Navi Health Care Coordinator and told that my husband would be discharged on July 4th. My job, she told me, was to find the safest possible location for him to be brought home to on that discharge date. And she strongly suggested that we consider he would be permanently wheelchair bound and uh, therefore highly recommended a skilled nursing facility self-pay. And if I lived in a home that was not handicapped accessible, which ours wasn't, then I needed to move. I shared my concern about the July 4th discharge date with the Seabury staff, and I was told that I had just entered a battlefield that I was going to be on in an attempt to keep my husband at that facility as long as he needed to be there. They told me that I could expect regular renewals or regular reviews of his health notes, that I could expect a series of notices of denial of Medicare payment accompanied by a discharge date that would be two days after I got that notice. And they told me that I could appeal, but if we won a couple of appeals, then we could expect that the frequency with which these denials were going to come would increase. In the seven weeks that Gary was at the Seabury Health Services Center, we received three of those notices of pending Medicare non-payment. The last two came four days apart. We won two of the appeals, we lost the third. My husband was discharged on August 17th, 7th. He came home by ambulance and was accompanied by an EMT who told us he seemed to have a low grade fever and had complained about headaches and neck pain with every bump in the road. He was disconnected disoriented. He was experiencing great difficulty in making the transfers from chair to walker to bed that he had mastered at Seabury. The next morning, we had to call emergency services because my husband did not know who he was, where he was, or who we were. He was taken to the Yukon Health Center where he was admitted and where he stayed for three weeks because he was discharged with bacterial meningitis. The reappearance of melanoma in 2022 pulled a rug out from under my husband and my family. Then came the added trauma which piled on steadily of having to fight to keep him receiving the care he needed. This should not be happening to families and patients. It's cruel. Our family continues to struggle with the question that I hear you asking today. Why are people who are looking at patients only on paper or through the lens of an algorithm making decisions that deny the services judged necessary by healthcare providers who know their patients and are interacting with them personally, and in some cases have been working them for, with them for months or even years. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ben.
Uh, I'm going to begin with questions. We're going to have seven-minute round questions. Uh, we're in the middle of votes right now, uh, as you may have gathered. So you'll see members come and go, including uh, myself and Ranking Member Johnson. If we need to take a brief recess, we will. But this is a really important panel on a critically significant topic. So thank you for being here, and thank you for bearing with us. Uh, Ms. Bent, uh, I particularly appreciate your powerful story of the real world consequences, as you have put it so well, of this broken system. It is a system that is failing people like yourself and your husband and your entire family, because as you have put it so well, the trauma hit not just your husband, but your entire family family, yes. and you were on a battlefield, mm -hmm. as you've called it, a battlefield that involved not only your husband's fight for his recovery, but your fight for the resources necessary to provide care. And one of my questions is whether you were ever given an explanation by this NAVA Health Care Coordinator for the reasons that he was discharged against the advice of your surgeon. The um, denial of the, the acute rehabilitation services, I did get a letter after he was in Seabury telling me why that service had been denied. Um, and it was, he couldn't withstand the therapy, the intense therapy. The other denials, um, I would appeal through Kipro, and the response I got was from them, which was just a reiteration of what the um, paperwork from Navi Health, I guess, had said about my husband, and then whether the reviewer agreed or disagreed. I don't know whether you know, but Nava Health actually relies on algorithms, not on a clinician's review, not on a physician or a surgeon examining the medical records of your husband, but on an algorithm. Right. And in fact, a lot of money's been made as a result of selling Nava Health and its system from one company to another, now mm -hmm. United Healthcare, where it is a subsidiary. And you mentioned the, the possibility of an appeal. Uh, I want to show you a poster which sets forth the numbers given by uh, Ms. Fugelston Benick. Uh, they may have uh, been uh, noticed less than they should have been when you mentioned them in your testimony, but I think they are probably the most important numbers that we will consider today, at least for me as a, as a juror here, uh, sitting in judgment of this system. 35 million requests for care Two million were denied completely. Only 11% of those denials were appealed. But of the number appealed, 80% were granted. In other words, the vast majority of appeals were found meritorious, but only a small percentage had the wherewithal, the patience, the time, the resources, or the simple fortitude in the face of this battlefield, as Ms. Bent has, decided, has described it, to actually take it to an appeal. What do those numbers tell you? So the relatively small share of appeals um, I think can point to several things. People may not know how to appeal. They may not believe they have a case to appeal. 
Um, people are often very ill when they're doing this, and if they don't have a caregiver or somebody else to assist them or legal access to legal services, um, going through that process can be difficult. Um, so it is a strikingly low number once you see how many are, are, are granted upon appeal. Of course, if all of them were appealed, you know, 80% may not be favorably determined. We don't know what would happen in the cases for those that were not appealed. Um, but it is striking that such a large number. And this, this, we looked across insurers, and this was consistent across nearly every t insurance firm that offers Medicare Advantage plans. They overturned a vast majority of their initial decisions upon appeal. Striking is the right word. Actually, I think it's shocking and stunning. Ms. Huberty, with your practical experience, what do these numbers tell you? They confirm everything that we see on a daily basis, absolutely. Um, we're usually involved in that, the, the bottom 80%. Um, when clients are able to come to us and we can explain the appeal process and we can walk with them through it, if they have an advocate who's been able to access our services and, and speak for them and help again while they're injured or ill, and we can be that support system. That, but that is absolutely what we see in our practice. And the denials, those two million, that are then successful in being overturned when they are appeal, are often the result of algorithms. Could you talk about how you've seen in your practical experience the real world effects of these algorithms? Right, so you mentioned the Navi Health System and their use of algorithms. The only reason I know about the document and that use of algorithms is because of taking these cases to the federal hearing stage, the administrative law judge hearings. And it's only then when I've requested the hearing file or the case file that would have been provided by the Advantage plan that I've seen that document. Um, but now that I've seen it and I know what it looks like and how it's referenced, I see it referenced often in when the um, Advantage plans do um, work with a medical reviewer, a medical director, they will often reference that predicted length of stay. You'll see the acronym PLOS. Um, and you'll also notice it too, it's decimal points. So and so will, is predicted a predicted length of stay of 16.6 .6 days and they'll receive the denial on the 17th day and we see that repeated. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna hold up a document that I'm gonna ask to be included in the record mm -hmm. without objection. It refers to a anticipated stay in length of days of 16.6 .6, and that's the date in fact, on the 17th day when, in one case, you were handling a discharge resulted. Uh, does this reflect your experience? Yes, yes it does. Um, Ms. Bent, you were never shown a document like this and you were never explained, uh, given an explanation about how the algorithm was the basis for a decision regarding your husband. No. Uh, my time has expired on this first round. I'm going to turn to the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, l let me describe this as a real problem. And my definition of a real problem is something that doesn't have an easy solution. And first of all, Ms. Bent, our, my sincere condolences on, on the passage of your husband. Um, it seems, and again, I've got years of experience buying private health care, watching these exclusions uh, being added to the policies to try and bring the cost down. Uh, I've got all kinds of questions. I'm trying to figure out how, how to zero it in. For, my overall question is how does this kind of pre-authorization compare with private insurance and truthfully what people try to do with normal and Medicare as well? Now, I had you know, in-laws that were being booted out of hospitals way before they were supposed to on Medicare. I don't think it's Medicare Advantage. So can somebody speak to how this compares to private insurance and how it compares to uh, Medicare. I can start. Um, so I have colleagues that have looked um, at similar questions in the health insurance marketplaces, but what we've found is that the data are not comparable, so you can't actually figure out how things compare. They have, they have other data that would be nice to have in Medicare Advantage, such as the reason for the denial of um, payments 
but the, the data for your first question simply is not available. Let me ask about the services being denied. It seems like an awful lot of what we're talking about here is long-term rehabilitation care. Is, there, is, that the, is that most of the 35 million requests or what, what else is being preauthorized and being denied? So that data does not tell us the particular services. I think other people on the panel can speak from other data they've looked at or their experience, what they've seen, but that data, one of the big gaps is it doesn't tell us the services. Oh, yeah. We're always missing information. Ms. Tinker, what, what can you add? So when we looked at this data, we took a month in June of 2019, and we really looked very closely at those prior authorization denials. And what we found is they fell into sort of three main buckets. One was post-acute care, which you were just mentioning, transfers from hospitals to either skilled nursing facilities or inpatient rehabilitation facilities. Another bucket that we found was significant were imaging services, specifically things like CAT scans and MRIs. And then the last was injections, generally for issues dealing with pain along the spine. Um, in addition, when we looked at our work and tried to make that comparison against original Medicare, what we found was with those prior authorization denials, 13% of them actually met original Medicare requirements. And one of the Medicare Advantage requirements is that it provide the same level of service that original Medicare does. So again, I'm trying to get to the, so why are these things, why are these services chosen for pre-authorization? I would think with long-term rehabilitative care, that's a big dollar amount, correct, in, in Medicare Advantage? The, the other two buckets you mentioned don't necessarily fit in that category. Is it, are some of these services generally abused or, or used when they're not needed? We have other evidence that shows that there are issues around fraud in the injection space. Um, and so that may be one reason that prior authorization is there. That's not something we looked at explicitly in that particular study. Um, but yes, um, it's not as expensive as issues around post-acute care. So are you seeing similar types of problems in primary Medicare? We don't have any work that looks specifically at primary Medicare on those particular issues, and prior authorization is not used as prevalent. Right, but denial of service or being booted out of a hospital early, I mean, those are probably issues of Medicare as well, correct? Specifically in the report that we did in the study from April of 2022, what we did, though, is looked at Medicare Advantage prior authorization denials and how they compared to the rules in original Medicare. And so the findings that 13% of the time original, medical, original Medicare would have paid raised significant concerns. Now those, was that 13% on appeals or is that 13% across the board in, in terms of the denials? That was across the board in terms of denials. denials. Okay. Well, Ms. Graber, I think you were putting your finger on why this is occurring. People are trying to control costs. Um, do you have any idea in terms of what the total dollar amount is that's at stake. I know you mentioned one figure. If you can kind of restate that. Sure. Um, if you take sort of one of the examples uh, that Megan just illustrated in post-acute care, we don't know the full amount on the Medicare Advantage side, but on the fee-for-service side, it, that's about $60 billion in annual spending. So if, you, if, if it's 50-50, kind of figure that's the same equivalent um, on the Medicare Advantage side. So you're probably looking at a total of roughly $120 billion in annual spending just in post-acute care. The, the chairman pointed out how much money uh, Medicare Advantage is making per patient. Uh, if, you, if you wiped out those profits, kind of what would happen to Medicare Advantage, what, where would they try and make things up? They might try to make it up on the fee-for-service side. Describe that a little bit more. So on the fee-for-service side, and in my testimony, I referenced some of the margins that providers enjoy from the fee-for-service rates. Uh, so there's certainly um, a discrepancy there as well. And I think the Medicare Advantage plans are paying attention to that on the fee-for-service side. And they're using tools like prior authorization to get at making changes and to bring some of those margins down. That's their ability to do that on the Medicare Advantage side. We're on the fee-for-service side. We can't really get at those costs and inefficiencies in the Medicare program unless Congress authorizes it. Are they also using the savings of the pre-authorization and then denial, either just justified denial or unjustified, 
they using that to, to fund the other benefits like dental and vision, that type of thing? Yeah, they're, they're reinvesting um, the money that they get from the Medicare program in a variety of different things. So supplemental benefits such as vision, dental and hearing, um, and a whole host of other things that are offered to beneficiary on the Medicare Advantage side that they're not able to get on the fee-for-service side. So if the solution to this problem would be we're not going to let Medicare Advantage plans do pre-authorizations, we're not going to allow them to deny coverage based on pre-authorizations, what would end up happening is what, probably one of two things. Either the cost of the taxpayer could go up pretty dramatically, or Medicare Advantage plans would have to pay her back in terms of what they cover. I mean, I would think those are the two, two most likely scenarios, correct? Yeah, I would say that both of those things would happen. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you. Uh, we'll turn to Senator Marshall. I'm going to go vote. Hopefully I'll be back uh, before he finishes. Uh, I'll let you vote first. Uh, and Senator Johnson's going to stay and preside uh, while I run or walk to vote. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me start by thanking you for co-sponsoring our legislation on prior authorization that would help solve some of the problems here. So thank you for your leadership and many other folks from this committee uh, as well. Uh, Mrs. Bent, thank you for sharing, sharing your harrowing story. Um, I can't imagine in your worst days what it would be like to have a 600-pound, 2,000-pound gorilla uh, that you were fighting with as well, f standing beside your husband as your vows said that you would do. I just can't imagine what that was like. And I want you to know that you have some fighters up here that are fighting for this issue. It was probably 10, 12 years ago, I was leaving the office and my nurse told me, hey, by the way, your surgery for tomorrow was canceled, your 730 case. And I said, oh, really? How come? Is the patient sick? And they said, no, uh, her insurance company had canceled it. And I said, well, why? Um, well, they just said it's canceled and you have to make an appointment to talk to a person uh, to see if they'll approve it. And I said, well, who, who, what was the name of the doctor that disapproved? Well, it wasn't a doctor. Um, you know, some type of a clerical person that had canceled the case. I want to submit for the record a couple documents. One is from a Dr. Ronald Chen, uh, who's one of the most respected radiation oncologists in the nation. He um, is a regular caller of our office needing help with this issue. All cases, um, an 85-year-old man with bladder cancer who had completed radiation and chemotherapy but needed a CAT scan. And again, this is a doctor who follows the guidelines. Radiation oncology, there's specific guidelines, a standard of care to get a CAT scan six months after that therapy that was denied. Another 69-year-old man with metastatic prostate cancer, the one of proton therapy, uh, was denied. A 74-year-old person with aggressive prostate cancer uh, was denied proton therapy, another 79-year-old with a prostate cancer that needed a follow-up PET scan that were all denied. Here's some other ones. Patient with cancer denied blood work. Patient with heart disease denied an EKG. Heart disease, EKG, imagine that. Patient recovering from a stroke denied physical therapy. A patient with MS and a tibia fracture denied a wheelchair. Patient with glaucoma denied eye exam and treatment, a patient with breast cancer denied reconstructive surgery. <clears throat> I couldn't imagine. I remember one month I had to tell three women in their, one was 29, two were 32, that they had metastatic breast cancer. And having, I couldn't imagine having to argue why these women wanted reconstructive surgery done at the same time as, as their treatment. Someone who's never went to medical school, someone who's never touched a patient making decisions. That's why we've been fighting for this issue now up here for, I, I believe, four years. Our legislation improving seniors' timely access to CARE Act is a bipartisan, it's bicameral. I believe it's the most co-sponsored bill and endorsements of any legislation up here. But unfortunately, it, it got a, a CBO score of $10 billion, and we'll maybe have time to talk about that later. Ms. Tinker, I want to thank you for your professionalism, that um, your understanding and an in-depth knowledge of this has helped us to take what we thought was good legislation and make it better. That's the way the process up, up here is supposed to work, and we appreciate your help as well. 
As you know, our bill requires, and this is for you, Ms. Tinker, as you know, our bill requires MA plans to report on detailed metrics related to prior authorization delays. By the way, that's what, how prior authorization is being used now. It's being used to delay care and deny care. That's what it's become a tool to be, is to delay care, hoping the patient dies so they don't have to give any more care, I guess. So our bill requires MA plans to report on detailed metrics related to prior authorization delays, denials, and appeals in the aggregate at the individual service. The proposed rules, however, merely require aggregate data. In light of your work, do you think reporting by CPT code and or individual service level would help the Office of Inspector General better assess and ensure that MA plans are complying with Medicare coverage rules? That's a complex question, sorry. That is a very complex question, thank you very much. Um, I would say anytime we can have more data and more information that's timely, complete, and accurate, it will help us to do a better job. Um, very recently, we issued a report that specifically noted that denial data is not included in Medicare Advantage encounter data, and that that hampers the ability of both OIG and other law enforcement agencies to do their jobs and to truly look at the data and find areas where fraud, waste, and abuse is occurring. You know, I think the misconception is the physician's office are very willing to do some type of uh, pre-approval process but most of this is streamlined, that we, we do 90% of my procedures are the same procedure, uh, the same you know, prerequisites. When, when should you replace someone's knee? When should you replace someone's hip? That we could do this all electronically. Uh, my next question, Ms. Benek Beninyak, help me out. I want to get it right. Dr. Fugelston Benek. Dr. Beninyak. Okay, Fugelston Benek. Thank you. Um, similar question for you. In your statement, you noted that the Kaiser Family Foundation analysis on prior auth in MA demonstrated a significant difference in the denial rates reported by the MA plans. Do you agree that more detailed individual service level reporting on delays and denials would help seniors better navigate which plans will meet their personal health care needs? Yes. You want to extrapolate? <laughs> yeah, so right now, uh, Medicare, or Medicare beneficiaries can choose from 43 plans. So, um, that is a lot, and the information that is available right now, you have to dig very, very, very deep to get any information on whether a prior authorization may or may not be required, um, and it's certainly not at the service level. Now, with 43 plans, it might still pretty, be pretty difficult to compare across plans, um, but it would be a step in a direction that would help for people who were who are interested, who knew they needed certain services, had particular conditions to at least be able to start um, on that endeavor. Thank you. Ms. Grabert, the Support Act, are you familiar with the Support Act? I am not. Okay, well, anyway, it requires CMS to establish electronic prior authorization in Medicare Part D. CBO said it would be negligible. Mm -hmm. Further, CMS estimated that implementing the regulations would, would uh, pr produce savings for plans and providers. Faxes have to be more expensive, and the appeals process is even more ex expensive. I just want to make sure that, you know, be clear, that our bill does not limit prior authorization. It streamlines it. Do you believe that making the system more efficient is better and cost-effective for patients, providers, and health plans? Yes, I do. Also, I believe in the, um, the regulation that CMS just finalized in April they were prohibiting the use of prior authorization for prescription drugs. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Graybird, I'll stay with you. Uh, Senators Thune, Brown, Sim, and I are circulating a, a letter to CMS urging them to finalize the prior author eggs mo modeled after our bill. As a former congressional staffer, congratulations. I do appreciate it. Uh, it's a tough life up here. I appreciate you going on and, and taking that skill set to what you're doing now. You understand the CBO scoring, which I don't. The proposed rules reduce the score to $10 billion. When finalized, and if they do adopt our real-time decisions and transparency requirements, we think it'll be $0. So here's our question. How do you consider this a warning sign for Medicare if the regulations, which produce savings, change the baseline so the score would drop down to something negligible? Good luck. I was gonna say first, I think what you told me may not be publicly available because I did not know about the reduction in score to $10 billion. Um, also, um, it, it, 
we, we, I haven't been privy to those conversations with CBO, so I don't know that the score would go down to zero. The only thing that I had available to me was a publicly available $16 billion score from the bill that was scored um, last Congress. Do you understand their logic and how they came up with those types of numbers? Yeah, I certainly do. Usually, um, CBO will discount the scores that they issue when CMS has an active proposed rule in place, which they do right now for the electronic system, which is my assumption as to how they got from 16 down to 10. Um, if CBO were to finalize it, it may drop further, but we don't know what their assumptions are to get in there. If CBO, if CMS was not to finalize that verification rule, I would assume that the score would go back up to 16 billion over time again. Where do you think, you know, in my mind, I just can't figure out where the CBO would think that this would cost the government money. Uh, it's a more efficient process. How did they come up with, you think, with the $16 billion? Where's the cost coming from? They assume that the restrictions and the reporting requirements may, may encourage plans to change their behavior, so they will be doing less prior authorization. Less prior authorization will, use, will result in more costly services and services being billed and it might change actually the bid rates that Medicare Advantage plans submit on an annual basis, all of which is greater um, cost to the taxpayer. That, those are the assumptions that CBO built into their score. Okay, thank you. Let me review my notes here. Usually I'd be yielding back about right now, but I think I'm about ready to, to wrap things up. I'm just going to move to recess then, it sounds like. We'll see if anybody else is coming back. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll see if anybody else is coming back from voting. The staff will let you know soon. This is go through the basic problem solving process. I come from a manufacturing background, do this all the time. We've taken the first step. We've admitted we have a problem here. So I think the next step is define the problem. If, if, if we have time, you know, what are the, what's the root cause of that? And then what are the solutions? So, and again, if, if uh, the first of you gets the definition right, you don't have to re redefine it. But I guess I'd, I'd like to start with you, Ms. Tinker. How would you define the problem? What our work showed is that prior authorization was being used at times when original Medicare would have paid for the service. It, do, you, it's, do, do you think just prior authorization itself is the problem or just not administered properly if people aren't following the guidelines? Our work looked at and showed that while prior authorization is useful as a tool in Medicare Advantage, it's that 13% of the time when original Medicare would have in fact paid for those services that created the problem. And our recommendations are really key towards how do you make prior authorization work better and how do you eliminate those times when original Medicare would have paid. Ms. Fugelston-Binnick, uh, 
Would you agree with that definition or would you change it slightly? Um, I agree with most of what um, Ms. Tinker just said. I would also add that from the perspective of policymakers conducting oversight, I think there is a lack of information to really then narrow in on what types of policies you might propose or other types of oversight you might do because we don't know the specific services unless you go and get the very detailed data and conduct a very labor intensive uh, review audit um, for really who is being affected, how often they're being affected, you know, is it are things being denied because they're deemed not medically necessary or providers aren't providing sufficient documentation? Those, those lead to very different solutions and without that information, it's hard to know how to Dr. solve the problem. You've got a sub problem here. You don't have enough information to really define the problem properly and then find solutions. So again, we're, okay, we're honing in on it. Uh, I'll, I'll give, uh, well, actually, Ms. Huberty missed this. Uh, uh, Ms. Graber, why don't you, we're going through the problem solving process trying to figure out what is the definition of this problem. Ms. Graybert. Yeah, I think there's certainly um, problems on the fee-for-service side that need to be addressed because MA plans are using prior authorization to actually get at some of those things. So I don't think the problem is necessarily prior authorization. I think there's some fee-for-service things. Now, when you say fee-for-service, is that you're going into the private sector? Or this fee-for-service in, I mean, describe what you're talking about there. So fee-for-service is just the option in Medicare that beneficiaries elect that allow them to get services directly without having a plan put together so a package So that's traditional Medicare is what you're talking yes. about then. Okay. But I, I would also maybe challenge the 13% number that Megan offered. So 13% doesn't actually seem all that high to me um, in the way that she's using it. So for example, for inpatient rehab facilities, 19% of what they're billing is actually on the fee-for-service side is an error every year. A lot of the services in the 13% number that Megan used come from an audit for at least four of those um, services were for inpatient rehab facilities. So if you're looking at the 19% that I just mentioned on the fee-for-service side versus 13% on the MA side, um, I, I feel a little bit more comfortable with that 13% because it's less error than what we're actually observing for some of those same services on the fee-for-service side. Okay, well, Ms. Ben, having gone through this, how, how would you define this problem? I would say that for my family, um, when this first came up, I, I went to Medicare website and looked at what I might expect for my husband. And I saw the figure of 100 days. So I, I think you can imagine how surprised I was when I was told after a considerably smaller number of days he was going to be discharged. Um, for me, the problem becomes an issue of trust. Even 100 days is a limit. What, 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 what would happen after the 100 days? You get discharged what? to a long-term care facility where you just, you, there's no hope for rehab? I mean, what, what, what's the next step then? These, can, these ladies can all correct me if I'm wrong, but what I read was after 100 days, we would have had the option of leaving him there and there would have been a copay that came into pray, place. Okay. okay. Well, so I would have had the option of saying, yes, I can cover this percentage of this fee. Right. Um, and he can stay there. So, Ms. Huber, do you want to take a crack at how you would define the problem we're dealing with here today? I think the, the main issue is that the Advantage plans are deferring the decision-making to a lot of third parties, and um, none of those third parties are the doctors that are meeting with the patients or, you know, they're treating therapists. They are rarely even looking at their medical records. Often it is that algorithm that starts the process and there is very little oversight. They are rubber stamp denial as they go through the process. So I think you're, you're kind of making the point I was making earlier in terms of our entire healthcare financing system is we're deferring all these decisions to a third party. Right. We're, we're saying we, we want it all, we want the best and we don't care what it costs. And that's a problem. So I'll throw out kind of a guideline of a, or a outline of a solution first try and reintroduce consumerism into healthcare as best as possible. And from my standpoint, that'd be the low end. You know, the, the things you can really make a choice on. Say, well, okay, I'm, 
I know I had an MRI last week, and I'd like another one this week, but nah, it's not worth it, okay? Um, and then have high deductible insurance plans that are actually insurance plans, without the exclusions, with, with, without you know, pre-authorization plans that are, that are being violated and denied. And that's, that's kind of the thought process that goes through my head, but I mean, do y'all acknowledge that this, it, it really is a problem and, and it, it can't be a, because we're spending so much and in the end people don't care what it's costing because either the government's paying for it up to a point or insurance care, that's causing costs to run higher than really any other country in the world. That, that's just a real, real problem, real issue here. So what, what, I kind of threw out my outline of solution. What, what's, what's your, what are your overall solutions? I'll, I'll start with you, Ms. Bend. And by the way, I, I have all the same thing in the world because we, we've had, you know, my in-laws, my parents. My parents fortunately didn't have my mother pass like within 24 hours, a massive stroke, but it was my mother-in-law and father-in-law that just went through the, and, hospitalization after hospitalization and getting booted out before they certainly felt they were ready to go home. And I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a horrible process. So you have my deepest sympathy, but what, what, what do you think? I would um, like to see the people who are actually giving the care and know the patient um, not being overridden in their decisions by a third party that is perhaps using software to make their decisions. And anecdotally, I will tell you that when it was time to stop, my husband's primary care was very clear with him and us about that. He knew when it was time to stop treating and stop pursuing uh, an elongation of something that was not going to change. So, I think they're trustworthy. I would yeah. so, go so, with them. And again, that, the pushback would be there are going to be some people going to game the system. You know, they you know, might have some financial gain by having people there. But you know, I, I would agree with you. I think you're making that point. Is we ought to just put trust in the doctors and nurses who are going to abide by the Hippocratic Oath, have the primary responsibility of the patient, not to Medicare, not to Medicare Advantage plan, but let them make the call. I, I think that's what most Americans would agree with. So, so then we have to address the cost at a different level then. We gotta figure out you know, how can we, that, that's where I keep going down to the you know, higher deductible plans that, that are true insurance, and you really let the care providers do that, and then try and bring consumers into the process for, for the little stuff where you, where you you do have time. You can make a decision. You can say, ah, "Okay, I will take the generic drug, or I'll, I'll do this. This is this is this is going to work, but it's a lot cheaper than that." If that makes sense to you, Ms. Graber? What do you what do you think? I'm going to stick to my theme on looking at fee for service Medicare again, because that's the part of the program that has very little consumerism. So right now. Beneficiaries who are in fee-for-service typically elect a Medigap plan for supplemental coverage as a wraparound service for them. There's absolutely no consumerism built into that model because they are shielded from almost all of the costs and out-of-pocket that you're looking at within that model. So Medicare Advantage really um, is well above fee-for-service in that respect. So if you really want to put consumerism in, I would say target Medigap plans on the fee-for-service side. What is, what is the cost per enrollee? Again, I, I don't have this off the top of my head. I, I'd always heard that Medicare Advantage is really popular because it offers better benefits, but it costs, in general, the government more because it has that. Is that, is that true? Yeah, it, uh, MedPAC estimates this year it's about 106% of what traditional Medicare will spend on similar beneficiaries. It's about 20, $27 billion in one year. Okay. I would have thought maybe it's higher than 6%, but okay. And, you know... To be fair, benef enrollees get, get something for that. They get lower cost sharing, they get extra benefits, um, but plans also benefit from that. And a key question is how much of the savings they generate should they get to keep? Should enrollees benefit and should the government get back? And right now the government gets none of it. So again, what you say, Ms. Graber, is rather than try and pinch pennies and result in the kind of abuses that uh, Ms. Uh, Bent had to put up with, you'd rather focus on traditional Medicare and try and bring some kind of 
consumerism, some kind of cost-saving measures there. Again, you don't want to apply the same thing. You want, you want to figure out a better way of controlling costs. Uh, Ms. Huberty, what, what, what do you say? Well, I think we've touched a lot on the, dif the differences between what fee-for-service or original Medicare is paying versus Advantage plans. The biggest issue that we're seeing and that Ms. Ben highlighted too is that the, the standards are being applied so drastically differently. If you have an original Medicare plan and you had the situation that she had or a supplement, her husband would not have gone through that. And so there has to be some sort of, you know, um, oversight or, you know, s some sort of, we have to be able to know why they're applying these standards differently and why as someone with original Medicare is, is getting a better benefit than Advantage plan with this particular service. Again, what, what standards? Because there is no pre-authorization with fee-for-service. There are standards with the, or, or is, is this just simply whether Medicare is going to reimburse regardless whether it's pre-approved? I mean, this is just whether you get reimbursed as a provider. Is, is that what you're talking about? In terms of the standards? You might be able to speak better to the provider reimbursement, but in terms of standards for a skilled nursing facility stay, it's, it's very basic where if a person needs five days a week of physical therapy or any types of therapy, then they should they get coverage under original Medicare. If they have an Advantage plan, they might get a denial and no one's even looking at the records. No one is even counting the days. So different questions. As a consumer, um, when you get to be an old guy like me, what, what are you going to choose? Well, every right choice. Now, I mean, if, if it was the same plan today, would you take traditional Medicare or would you take uh, Medicare Advantage? Choosing a health insurance plan is a highly individualized process, and I don't know enough about your medical that's, history. That's um, <laughs> however, what I will say, though, is if, and this would be to anyone with an Advantage plan, I would say they can be very great and they're important and they do offer those supplemental benefits at times. But if you ever need skilled rehab the way that Ms. Ben's husband did, to expect this to happen, to is, absolutely is that expect the, Is that it. the main problem in, in uh, rehab? Is, I mean, is that really the, I mean, in terms of the definition of our problem here today, is that the main problem? I am here today to speak on that because our agency has become overwhelmed with these cases to the point that we've started turning them away. And so for me here personally, yes, this is, this is a huge problem well, for we're, beneficiaries. We're seeing the baby boom generation. Right. Uh, Ms. You looked like you wanted to say something, Ms. Graver. I was just going to say I would choose Medicare Advantage today, and I put both of my parents in Medicare Advantage. Okay. Anybody else have a different opinion than that? Would you also take Medicare Advantage? I don't think you're going to be held to the standard of uh, giving advice to consumers. I, I'm stalling for time here. I was. No, I, re I, re I, re I, really, I really wasn't. So, you know, Mr. Chairman, what do I, was, I was going through the problem-solving process here, okay, asking them to define it define the problem. I think it, you know, we pretty well came to the, I think, the conclusion that it really is this pre-authorization, not necessarily following the rules. Um, it seems mainly with rehabilitative care is, is the main issue. And we were kind of starting to talk, talk through some solutions. So again, I, I appreciate your absences. <laughs> Gave you some opportunity. I apologize for my absence. Uh, I got stalled on a train that stopped and then uh, we had a second vote, so I'm now, I've now voted twice, and uh, Senator Johnson will have to leave at some point. Uh, but maybe I can pick up uh, a little bit where we left the conversation uh, on the um, new CMS rules. Uh, I've looked at those rules. I have a hard time making sense of them. Maybe somebody can explain to me what those rules actually do, because I'll read you um, the summary. Uh, the new rules include the following requirements. Prior authorization may only be used for one or more of the following purposes. To confirm the presence of diagnoses or other medical criteria, that are the basis for coverage determinations for the specific item or service or for basic benefits to ensure an item or service is medically necessary based on standards specified in section 422.101.C1 or for supplemental benefits to ensure that the furnishing of a service or benefit is clinically appropriate. I don't see how those rules guarantee 
that everything covered under Medicare will be covered under Medicare Advantage without the rigmarole and the runaround that people have been experiencing. Ms. Tinker, maybe you can enlighten me. So in response in part to our report from April of 2022, CMS issued a rule in April of this year, and that rule confirms that MAOs must comply with original Medicare criteria. Um, in addition, some of the recommendations we made in our report were that those same issues be incorporated into the audits that CMS does of Medicare Advantage plans. So checking to make sure, in fact, those things are occurring. But there's nowhere in this rule that says you have to get everything under Medicare Advantage that you would under Medicare. And in fact, as, uh, as we've heard, uh, because I think, uh, I'm looking at my notes, uh, Ms. Finkelstein uh, Benick said it, we don't have enough data to know at this point, is that right? Yes, I think it's challenging to assess. Challenging to assess is absolutely right. So for people in Ms. Bent's position, that's gonna have real world con consequences in terms of uncertainty, unknowability, unenforceability, and potentially more appeals, more red tape, correct? Yes, potentially. Uh, Ms. Huberty, uh, could you give me your assessment of whether these rules are going to clarify and solve all these problems? I, I don't know enough about the, chain, the proposed rules or the enacted rules to speak on that, but I, I don't know that it needs to clarify because it's already, it, it, it's already a rule that Medicare Advantage plans must cover the same as, as must provide at least the same benefits as, as original and Medicare. That is exactly my point, that it's not a problem with rules, it's a problem with compliance and enforcement. In other words, the Medicare Advantage plans basically have been flouting their obligations under existing law without a new rule, correct? Absolutely correct, yes. And a new rule is only as good as their being willing to change their real world practices and CMS enforce those obligations, which it has been failing to do, correct? Correct, yes. Um, Ms. Graber, uh, Senator Johnson asked you a question about, let me hold up the profits um, poster. Uh, he, he asked you, uh, in effect, whether Medicare Advantage might be taking some of their additional revenue and putting it into dental and vision and other services that come with Medicare Advantage, but not with Medicare, correct? You remember your testimony? And you said that was true. But uh, the additional profits from going to Medicare Advantage are after those expenses, are they not? Yes, they are. Okay, so they've already made the investment and they are, in fact, let me just put it in layman's terms, they're making a ton more money than those other categories of insurance even after the benefits that they provide. I guess I would need clarification on your response. I, because I, I don't really understand the methodology. I, I don't know what the actuarial value is for dental vision and hearing. So I don't know that those things could have been taken into consideration and removed from those numbers. Well, if I tell you that the profits, and I think this point is largely uncon uncontradicted, that profits for Medicare Advantage exceed those in other types of plans, despite having invested in those additional services, it leaves me to conclude that they could maybe reduce some of their profits. 
and provide some additional services, for example, to Ms. Ben's husband and still make pretty good profit, but just not as large as they would otherwise. Does that make sense? Yeah, certainly. And, and I think there are a number of different policies that Congress can take on. So, for example, um, the quality bonus payments that are made to Medicare Advantage plans that were instituted in the Affordable Care Act really lead to a lot of those numbers. Um, and so Congress could address some of those policies to reduce some of those profit margins if they so choose to. So we could reduce the profits for Medicaid, Medicare Advantage. Would you recommend that? I think there's a lot of people that would, rec would encourage Congress to specifically look at those quality bonus payments that were included in the Affordable Care Act, yes. But as an alternative, maybe Medicare Advantage plans could include care for Ms. Ben's husband, which is what they promised to do. Correct? Certainly. Okay. Um, let me ask you, um, in your report, Ms. Tinker, uh, a central concern that you expressed was about payment models, um, like the one used for Medicare Advantage, as you know, and um, the, as you call it, potential incentive for insurers to deny access to services or for payments in an attempt to increase their profits which we've been discussing. KFF has analyzed how much insurers make for each Medicare Advantage enrollee as compared to enrollees in other kinds of insurance as we've demonstrated here. Uh, can you tell us why insurers have that in incentive? Yes, so in original Medicare providers are paid based on the specific services they provide. However, in Medicare Advantage, Medicare Advantage plans are paid a capitated rate, so a single amount per member per month to provide services regardless of the cost or the number of the services. And as a result, unlike in original Medicare, plans make more money by providing fewer services. I'm going to interrupt my questions to let Senator Johnson. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I apologize. I have to go vote, and then uh, Speaker Paul Ryan's getting his portrait unveiled, so I've got to go to that ceremony. But to, just real quick, going back to the the profit per enrollee, it sounds like this is a reasonably robust competitive market. Though you've got nine companies, 33 different plans, are they colluding to drive up profits, or is there not? Do we need to encourage more competition as opposed to trying to lower costs by some government edict? That'd be my question. I mean, generally, competition works pretty well. I'll say this market has exploded in the last several years. The 43 plans this year is twice as many as was available in 2018. In some markets, the same insurer offers a dozen or more different plans. Um, so I don't think more plans is probably the answer. Some places have 80 plans. It, it's really helping the, 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 the beneficiary figure out what the meaningful differences are between those plans and what would best suit their and needs and preferences. Yeah, it's, it's not one company having 10 plans. It's nine different companies. Having so, so, so seven to 10 plans. So, so if it's only one company in, in a region, that's not competition. So is that, is that what's happening? No, most markets, over 50% of markets have at least nine different firms participating and offering plans. Again, I just, I'm scratching my head then, why, why isn't there greater, you know, why isn't there, why doesn't it look like there's better competition on this thing? But anyway, appreciate the indulgence, and again, th thanks for holding this hearing, and thank, thank all the witnesses. Take care. Uh, I'll just follow up on that question. Um, the, the insurers make more than double for each Medicare Advantage enrollee than for other insured individuals, like people in employer-sponsored plans. So all of these so-called competitors know they can make more money with Medicare Advantage plans. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So if their goal is to make money, they're all going to, in effect, benefit 
from the products while their beneficiaries are put at a disadvantage by the prior authorization. I'll also add that they compete for their enrollees by offering these extra benefits. Um, and so in the way they are able to offer the extra benefits is by lowering the bid for Medicare covered services. So to the extent they can use prior authorization or networks, referrals, other types of utilization and cost management tools, they will be able to get a larger rebate from CMS and be able to offer more extra benefits. It's a kind of bait and switch plan. They bait people to come in with the promise of providing more, but in fact, many of the beneficiaries receive less, correct? Well, I certainly wouldn't put it that way. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to uh, put it in the way that uh, one of, I think one of your clients, Ms. Huberty, put it, uh, which is uh, after the denial I read in one of the articles about the work that you do that I think it was one of your clients said, it works until you need the big stuff. Maybe you can explain what that means. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to the point of the supplemental benefits, enticing people into taking them, that's the, the short term. And we all have you know short term goals. It's easy to save money at the beginning and to say, I'm going to get these extra things that original Medicare doesn't cover. Um, that's really you know, enticing for me to take this plan. There might be a, a low um, premium as well. But most of us don't think about the, the larger problems when they're actually going to need help. And, and like um, in Ms. Ben's case, they looked and they saw 100 days of coverage. That's what they expected to need when, when the time came. And absolutely, I would say it's a bait and switch because you, you get to that point when you do actually need those bigger things and, and you're denied. So it looks like a good plan as long as all you need is like dental or vision. Everybody needs dental or vision. Nobody plans on melanoma, correct? Correct, yes. Or on other kinds of acute rehabilitative or long-term rehabilitative care. Yes, that's correct. Um, and uh, Ms. Bent, when you signed up for Medicare Advantage, obviously you, you had no idea that this tragedy was going to befall your family. Actually, um, Gary was a retired state employee, and his benefits are determined by the Office of the State Comptroller. And looking at the website for um, state retirees, it appears to me that if you are of an age that makes you eligible for Medicare, you're on a managed Medicare plan. That was almost automatically as a result of your being on the state. Correct. Someone else made the decision for us that we would be on a Medicare Advantage plan. And periodically, someone else makes the decision for us that we will, that plan will be administered by a different company. Your, your husband taught physics at the University of Connecticut when he retired. He, he was, yeah, he was that. Yes, he was at the University of Connecticut for 23 years. Okay. By the way, I'm a retiree <laughs> from the University of Connecticut as well. Yes, so you have the <laughs> some of the same issues. <laughs> um, I want to uh, go back to the appeal uh, questions, Ms because I think we began talking about them, and I'm not sure that you had the opportunity to explain what the barriers and the hurdles are to overcoming a denial. Maybe explain a little bit why only 11% of people actually appeal when the results are seemingly so positive. Well, in the cases of skilled nursing facility denials, you're getting the appeals, you're getting the denials and the appeal instructions in real time. So in Ms. Ben's case, they're getting them as they're trying to recover from the illness. It's not like you get an x-ray and then three months later you get the bill and then you try to deny it at that time or try to appeal that denial at that time. 
So you have people who are very vulnerable, who are very sick, very ill, trying to recover, trying to get back home, getting thrown appeals at them, not knowing usually what they're signing or what's being asked of them. They'll do whatever is thrown at them. Usually it's appealing by phone. And once you get to those first two levels um, of phone appeals generally, because those are handled immediately, the next step is requesting a federal administrative law judge hearing. And I would say most people assume that they need an attorney to do that, or if they don't realize that, they just think that process sounds far too daunting to, to continue. Um, again, they're trying to recover, they're trying to get better. Um, that's, I, I, Ms. Benton and I were speaking before the hearing and it sounded like my experience is exactly what she experienced too. So even if you are successful in an appeal while you're still in the facility, you can expect another denial in a matter of days and that review will continue about every three days. Even if you're successful in appealing on a first round, you can be stuck on later rounds with the same algorithm-driven denial. Generally, the algorithm is first applied when the person is um, first admitted in the skilled nursing facility. I haven't seen it come up since then, but what happens is it's almost once you've been flagged as someone who might need to leave now or doesn't meet these care cr coverage criteria anymore, you're kind of in the system for those denials and they're having these reviews. Um, I believe it's between Navi Health and the, the provider as well are going through reviews every three days. And so far as uh, the potential for um, competition is concerned, my understanding is that there are a small number of companies that dominate this market. Is that correct? In terms of the third party contractors? Exactly. Yes, I know of two. Yes. Um, we're going to have to leave it now, uh, but you've given us a lot of really good information. This investigation will continue. Uh, there's a lot here that needs to be known. And we're going to investigate with a goal of not only making Congress know it, but also the public and people like Ms. Bent and everyday Americans that um, have a real stake, real world stake, what the outcomes are. We've been talking a lot here at a 30,000 foot level, but Many of you, Ms. Huberty, Ms. Ben, have seen it up close and how it impoverishes and deeply impacts people, impoverishes them financially, but also spiritually when they have to be on the battlefield when at the same time their loved ones are fighting for their lives. And the battlefield simply shouldn't be there. They shouldn't have to fight and ensure at the same time as their loved one is fighting for his life. Uh, so we want to know how these algorithms work, how these profits are so high, why people are potentially deceived into thinking that Medicare Advantage will be there for them, because the fact of the matter is it works until you need it. It works fine so long as you don't needed for the big stuff, like melanoma, like long-term care, like certain kinds of injections and other kinds of needs that everyday Americans have. So uh, we're going to uh, adjourn now this hearing. The record will remain open for 15 days for any additional comments or questions by any subcommittee member. I would invite any of you, if you have additional thoughts or responses to questions that have been asked here that maybe you feel you didn't get an opportunity to answer fully, uh, encourage you to submit written responses as well. And uh, thank you all very, very much.